Matthew 18 is where we're going this morning. We're going, to read, we're going to read the whole chapter. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him, placed the child among them, and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like this, like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Sorry about that. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it will be better for them to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, Cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that has wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he's happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bound on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, It will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. 
His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I'll pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancel all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailer to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat you, will treat each of you, unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May God bless the reading of his word. Can you hear me? Yep. Let's start with prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the time that we can come here and worship you. And Father, I pray that your spirit will be upon this place today and you will have us hear the words that you would have us to hear and apply them to our hearts, Father. May we be a united family that loves one another and draws each other to, um, closer to each other and to the world to you, Father, that they may come to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we just thank you for that. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to ask you a question. I was going to do this later, but two of my brothers presented me with a perfect opportunity to do this now. Can you read that? You know what it says? Think you got an idea? You be quiet. Everybody think they know what it says? What does it say? Let's see if that's what it says. Let's see if we can get it apart first. Is that what it says? It doesn't say anything, but you thought it said jumping to conclusions, didn't you? Okay? So let me say this next. I love my brothers. I love Barry and I love... Um, Bob, but sometimes they jump to conclusions. The reason that I was walking behind huffing and puffing is because I knew our mission yesterday. Our mission was to go to Hobby Lobby, where I would have to walk for hours upon hours. So I paced myself up and down that mountain so that I would be good for Hobby Lobby. Okay? So now you hear the rest of the story. See how it changed? And Bob, you just didn't know where to look for the snack, because you got the snack brought. So... We jump to conclusions sometimes, but I want to say this, that this is a family that loves one another. And even though I'm going to talk about taking the eye out of church today, this church does it very well. This is a serving, loving community, and I'm thankful to be part of it. So the sermon today is called Taking the Eye Out of Church. And we read Matthew 18, and you're probably wondering, well, how does all that apply? Well, we're going to look and see. And you're probably also thinking that church doesn't have an I in it. It has a you in it, right? Well, that's right, because it's all about you, about everyone else. It's not about my needs. Sorry about that. It's about how I can serve. It's an act of serving. When I worry about my needs, then I get the picture screwed up. And I don't understand what God's plans are and His desires are. But His desire is for me to serve, just as Jesus Christ came to this earth and served. And what more of a capacity did he do it in? He was God that gave up his throne in heaven to not only come to serve, but to die for our sins and take our place so that we would not receive eternal punishment, but instead life. And a life that we don't need to waste on this earth, but we need to give to him. In Matthew 16, 18, we learned last week that that was the first time that the word church um, was mentioned. And it says, I tell you that you are Peter... And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. That was the first time we saw the word church in Scripture. Jesus said it. 
And he said, it was my church. So don't forget that. We belong to Jesus for his purpose, his needs, his desires. And sometimes we get confused. When we first read that, we think, well, maybe it's something about Peter. It's nothing about Peter. The only thing that was about Peter was Peter had that moment where he said, I realize it because God revealed it to him. Took the veil from his heart and from his face and said, do you realize why Jesus is here? Who Jesus is here? And he, Jesus asked that question. And when Peter realized it and answered, Jesus was like, wow, finally, you get it. Upon that profession of faith, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. It was a moment that struck, stuck out. Just like when we learned that the Christians were first called Christians in Acts. It was a time when Christians were behaving the way that they should behave. Totally different from what we had seen before. We didn't see cowardly Christians that were ashamed of the gospel message. We saw Christians that boldly preached the gospel message, that lived a life accordingly. And the same thing here. This is the first time we see the word church because it's the first time that they finally got it. But if you read on a little later, Matthew 18, like we just read about today, that we see they're grumbling among themselves, who's going to be the most important? How quickly we lose focus of what's important in our lives. The word church is from the Greek word ecclesia, which was two words formed together, meaning an assembly of those who are called out or called out ones. So remember that. And I gave you a definition last week that said the church is a body of believers who have been called out from the world by God to live as a holy people. Under the authority and headship of Jesus Christ, we are that church. When we realized what Jesus Christ did, we couldn't have a church until He came. He died and He brought us into the family of God if we accepted Him as Savior. He rose again to give us new life. We are a new creation. We're not the same that we were. Does that mean we're going to stop sinning immediately? No, it doesn't. But it means we belong to Jesus. We are His. We are called to be a holy priesthood. We're not called just to be Christians. We're called to be a body of believers that get along together. And it's tough. That's why one of the reasons that He even left His Spirit, so we could be united with one spirit, with one goal, so that we could love one another just as Christ loved and gave Himself for the church. He calls us out from the world to be different so that others will see that love and so that it will draw them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, talks about the living stone and a chosen people. I'm going to read that for you. It says, As you come to Him, the living stone, which is Jesus, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, or the temple of the Spirit, to be a holy priesthood. That's what we're called to do. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in it, Scripture says, from Isaiah 28, 16, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. And from Psalms 118, 22, Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And from Isaiah 8, 14, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that may cause them to fall. It's so cool how Jesus fulfills all the, the prophecies. He, he shows it to us in Scripture. And it's so amazing. Those words were written hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus came to this earth. Go on in verse 8, it says, They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But, complete reversal, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Special to God. That is so awesome. That's who we are, and we need to behave that way. How or why? That you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God, a family, the church, Jesus' church. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
Because Jesus took all of our shame upon ourselves. Let me borrow your water. We have the right to be children. And as children, we receive all of the things that we should receive as adopted children. All of the blessings. We belong to God. And He wants to so richly pour out His blessings upon us. If you look at John chapter 1, verses 11 through 13, we read, He came to that which was His own, but His own did not receive Him. Yet to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Don't ever forget that. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. If you are a Christian, you've been born again to serve out a purpose. And not just a purpose as an individual, but a purpose as a family. I know it's noisy, isn't it? Trying. Okay. We'll see if that helps. Satan wants to deceive you, though. He wants you to lose focus so that you live a worthless life instead of a worthy life. So that you miss the mark. He doesn't want you to realize what's important. He wants us to quarrel and bicker rather than love one another, which is the defining characteristic of a Christian and the church. James 1, verses 16 through 19 warn us. It says, Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift that is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows... He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all He created. You go back in the Old Testament, the first fruits were the cream of the crop. They were the best. And if you remember, that's what you took and put on the altar. And we're supposed to be the same way. We're supposed to give our best to God and that's what we're supposed to give up in service and sacrifice to Him. That's what we're called to do. The next section is called listening and doing in many of your Bibles. So we're warned not just to listen to the Word, but to do it. Verse 19, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. God gave us new life for a purpose. If we let the devil deceive us, and if we get angry with our brothers and sisters, if we hold a grudge or whatever that may be, We are hindering God's work. We are not bringing Him glory and honor. Instead, we're letting Satan be the God and ruler of our lives. We're bringing a mockery to what Jesus Christ came and did on this earth. He gave up His crown, His throne in heaven. Everything that He was, He gave up to die for our sins. And many times we take that for granted. If you look at the first Peter passage... It's always good to read the whole passage so you can get the whole concept. If you look prior to those verses that we read, 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3, Peter describes that you cannot be a living stone unless you do something. Unless you do what? Verse 1, Therefore rid yourselves of all, not some, not do your best, but rid yourselves of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, Slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk. Why? So that it may be so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. God expects that of us. Like I said, it's not just boom that we don't sin anymore. There's going to be sin. There's going to be sin in our lives. There's going to be sin in the church. But we have to realize that. We have to realize our purpose and we need to give that sin to God, not let it take over. If you look after that passage, 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, the verses just after it, and your Bible may say living godly lives in a pagan society, tells us the same thing. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, we don't belong to the world, we've been born again, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. You can't help it, that's what the devil is going to be here for. He wants to rob you. He wants to make you ineffective. He wants to do whatever he can to stop you from reaching others with the gospel message. But instead, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God 
on the day that He visits us. There's so many ways to witness. The movies are one way, so please get those and please share them. Invite people. Chuck invited some people Thursday that came to the movie. We hope they'll be back. Jerry invited different people on Friday. And I got a hug from one of the gentlemen that said he really enjoyed it. It's what a blessing. People are coming to church that wouldn't come otherwise. They're hearing the gospel message that maybe they wouldn't have came to the service. It works. And it's not as offensive. Jacob this week told me about a young man that he had seen him um, at the China Kitchen. I think that's right in Sandpoint serving. And he's now working at Tomato Street down there. And just from his appearance, you might jump to conclusions that he's not a Christian because he's got tattoos and stuff. Some people think that that makes you not a Christian. But uh, Jacob looked and he said, Why you got a tattoo of a cross? And he began to tell him why he was a Christian. So then Jacob and him were talking while other people there at Tomato Street were listening to why they believed in Jesus Christ. So we have plenty of opportunities to witness. We just have to take the most, take the advantage, and and pray for boldness just as the Acts Christians did. (coughs) Once you've been born again, your life is not your own. It belongs to Jesus. It belongs to His church. And we're not just individuals. We need to be a part of a church body. It's not okay just to say, hey, well, I know that church is a good thing, but I really don't go to it or participate in it because I don't see the necessity. Then you're not reading Scripture very well because Jesus called out His church to do mighty and wonderful things. In fact, He said that through the power of the Spirit, because we have numbers, we all have the Spirit in us, we'll do mightier things than He did alone. And that's a crazy statement. I mentioned to you last week that Matthew started out with the introduction of Jesus Christ. And then we read different things throughout it. We read Matthew 16. We read Matthew 18. It closes with the Great Commission. And the Great Commission was a commission that was given to the church, not just the individual. It was given to the body of Christ because the body of Christ could be so much more effective than just one member alone. The next time that the word church is mentioned is in Matthew 18. We read it today. And I want to go over that whole passage, not just take one section. In verses 1 through 5, it's entitled, The Greatest in the Kingdom of Heaven. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed a child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change, you have to depart from the ways that you were. You have been called out from the earth to be different and become like, a little, ch- become like little children. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Matthew 16 was the first time we saw church. It's when there was that aha moment and Peter realized what was going on. But now just two chapters later, we see him arguing about I. And that's why I said we need to take the I out of church. It's not about us. It's about God. We've got to remember that because the world tells us it's all about us. That we deserve all this. We deserve that. And it's easy to fall into that lie. Because you work hard, you earn money, you spend it on things. But do we need to do that? Or do we need to be focused more on God? He he is the one that provides for us in the first place. Without Him giving us the opportunities, without Him giving us our health and everything else, we wouldn't be able to make the income to support our family. It's only by God's grace that we're able to. Church has a you in it, not an I. Remember that. It's all about what I can do for others. It's not about how I get my needs fed, fed, whether I like this type of music or not, whether I like this person or not. It's how I can serve for the betterment of the body, which Christ is the head of. Mark 9, verse 33 and 34 says this, 
They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet. Why do you think they kept it quiet? Because they knew what they were doing is wrong. They knew it. They knew that arguing among themselves was totally against what Jesus was trying to teach them. Because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. They argued about I, rather than focusing on you, rather than focusing on Jesus' church and their duties. Going back to Matthew 18, verses 6 through 9, that section is entitled, Causing to Stumble. It says, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. I don't know about you, but that's pretty tough words. And Jesus is saying that if you cause someone to stumble, not fall, but just stumble, that it would be better for you to drown yourself in the depths of the sea. Verse 7, Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to that person through whom they came. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of, of hell. So many people that want to discredit the Bible say, oh, they're talking about self-mutilation here. It's not what it's talking about at all. But... Can we take it literally? I hear so many people say we don't need to take it literally either. Why not? If you can't get past your addictions and everything, if you can't get past stealing or whatever it is, would it not be better for you to lose your hand? Now, I'm not saying to go mutilate yourself either by any means, but I'm showing you the severity of what your actions are doing, especially if you take it in the context of causing someone else to stumble. Because once you're a Christian, you've been born again. You've been set apart by God. So if you continue to do things that cause the world to stumble, instead of you doing your purpose of drawing them closer to Jesus Christ, to salvation, to reconciling them with the right relationship with God, you're driving them further away. So would it not be better to cut off your hand? If we keep reading Matthew 18, 10 through 15, it's the parable of the wandering sheep. So Jesus shows us here that how important it is if even one sheep strays. Verse 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. Little ones means those who believe, believers, Christians. For I tell you that there are angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Did your Bible say that? Might not have. Because verse 11 is omitted from some Bibles. Did you notice that or did you even notice that? Does your Bible show that? See footnote, okay. (laughs) But that's the whole purpose, is it not? And not all of our texts agree because we go back on historical documents. Some of them have it in there, some of them don't. But whenever you have a deviant like that, a textual variation, if you take that out of the, the Scripture, it shouldn't really change anything. And it doesn't if you have the mindset of Christ. But if you're not and you're just kind of skimming over, you, re- you miss the point. That is why Jesus Christ came. So if a sheep wanders because you've caused them to stumble, you've done the exact opposite of why Jesus came to this earth. So I think that footnote matters. Verse 12, what do you think? So he's asking them again just like he did in, in Matthew 16, where he said, who do you say that I am? Now he's saying, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hill and go to look for the one that has wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that have not wandered off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. That's how important relationships are to God. How important each and every one of you And each and every one of them out there in the world is worth to God. He loves. He loves unconditionally and thank goodness for His character. If we keep reading, verses 15 through 20, it's called dealing with sin in the church. Now, did we just change topics here or what did we do? 
No, it's built upon the same preceding passages. Sin rears its ugly head just like it did in the garden. You have the concept of church, and church is to be a great thing that draws people to Jesus Christ. But just two chapters later, we see us arguing over I rather than you. We see our needs being more important. So sin arises in the church. It happens, but we need to deal with it when it does. If your brother or sister, and the Greek word here is fellow disciple or believer, sins, and does your Bible say against you or not? King James Version says against you. I don't remember which ones do. NIV does not say against you. Go out, go and point out their fault, huh? NIV does? Okay, well, this NIV didn't, whichever one it is. So, there are different ones that have those two words in and those that don't. I might have NIV 1984 or something, I don't know. Go, go out and point their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. Now we have the second time that church is used in the Bible. If they refuse to listen to even the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with you also. If you take just that scripture by itself, and so many times you hear people saying it, the way you take it is, I have been offended in church, therefore I need to go do something about it and make that person realize it and make them apologize to me. But that's not what this passage is saying at all. If you take it in context, there's no I. That's what Jesus was pointing out altogether. And if you take a textual variant, it shouldn't matter if those two words are in the passage or not. And I struggled and struggled with this till I found out that that was a textual variant. I'm like, just doesn't make sense to me why Jesus would be talking about I now when I doesn't fit into His plans at all, doesn't fit into the gospel message at all. But if you take that against you out, then okay, wait a minute. It just took myself out of the picture, didn't it? I is gone. It just says if your brother or sister, your fellow believer sins, then you need to address that sin. Why do you need to address that sin? Because you don't want to cause people to stumble. You don't want a sheep to wander off. If you take it in the whole context of the passage. But when you throw that little two words in there against you, then, it, then it's hard for us not to take it personally. I have been wrong or I have been offended. But it's a textual variant. That means if you take it out, it makes no difference. So if you take I out of the equation, it doesn't make any difference, does it? And that's what we need to remember. Whenever we see something and something offends us or whatever, we need to take I out of the situation and see what it is in the scheme of God's plans and His church for unity rather than division. Because it's not important. That's one thing my wife always tries to do. She tries to stand up for me if somebody's done something against me. And I'm like, honey, it's okay. It doesn't matter. And she's just trying to stand up for her man. She's fighting for her family. But it's not important. It's not important if I am offended for the gospel message. Not important at all. What's important is the gospel message is spread to the world. And that's what's important. God's plans. His desires. <clears throat> Those who are called out are to be Christ-centered, not I-centered. We're supposed to worry more about others than we are ourselves, just as Jesus did. So it doesn't make any sense to be worried about whether I have been offended or I've been hurt. And then the second thing, it says if your brother sins, not that you've been offended. We're talking about true, legitimate sin. If there's sin going on in the church, it needs to be addressed. And the reason Jesus is addressing it so fast is that's just the course of things. You have something that's good with a good purpose, and then Satan is going to come in and deceive so that he can distort that purpose, so that he can take the focus away from God, so that he can make it ineffective. So it's only natural that we see sin next. It's just the progression of things. And we fight a spiritual battle. We need to remember that and be aware of that. 
Matthew 5, this is some of Matthew's earlier writings, said this, verse 38 through 48. First section is called, An Eye for an Eye. You have heard that it was said, Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Now that sounds like what we want to hear from eye standpoint, doesn't it? He wronged me, therefore I deserve to wrong him back. And we can apply that same thing to a church, right? But we're not to. Jesus says right after that, but, complete reversal, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants you to sue and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Next section is entitled, Love Your Enemies. Not love your church, your believers, but love your enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Sounds like good eye logic again, doesn't it? But, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? That you may be children of your Father in heaven. We were born again. We are in God's family. Not just individuals, but God's family, His church. He causes the sun to rise and the evil, uh, on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Be, the, be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. I don't see anything about I in that passage, do you? In fact, he tells us the complete opposite when he says but. So there's no way that it can be about I and the church. It has to be all about you, about others. We have to have unity in the family of God if we're going to reach people effectively. It has nothing to do with me personally. It has everything to do with God. So if your brother or sister sins against you, those two little words don't matter, do they? If we look at it and focus that way, we will focus on God's needs, the church's needs, and the church is to reach others. So will I get offended from time to time? Will I get hurt? Will I even maybe get sinned against? Maybe. But what is important is that we carry on God's mission and plan as a united body of believers. Going back to Matthew 18, verse 21 through 35, the rest of the chapter, it's called the parable of the unmerciful servant. So now that we see that we're supposed to give grace and forgiveness rather than hold condemnation. Verse 21, it says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, How many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And Peter was thinking, Seven times? That's plenty, right? Said Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. And that means seventy times seven. 490 times, a ridiculous amount of times. Infinity, if that matters. <coughs> Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, which is 20 years' worth of work in that day, was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and that all he had be sold to repay the debt. At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But the servant did the exact opposite. When the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, a day worth of work, instead of twenty years. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. He refused to offer mercy, pity, and grace. Instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in and said, You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? How could it be about me? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailer to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. 
This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. It's not about me. There's no I in church. There is a you. Remember that. And we are called to be Jesus' church, His body, one in mind and spirit with the head being Christ. The church must be united and it must forgive just as we must forgive as Christians. Remember the definition I gave you. Jesus' definition that we read in Matthew 16 was His body of believers called out from the world by God to live as holy people, His holy people, under His authority and headship. That's what we are as His church. So if you can come, this is the books we were talking about. And you're welcome to grab one. There's 25 in here or whatever. A lot of people already have them. So I want everybody to get one. If you can come, come. If you can't, follow along. Tonight we're going to go over chapter 1. And you can read chapter 1 in probably 15 minutes. They're small chapters. There's a few study questions at the end. The first chapter is entitled, I Will Be a Functioning Church Member. And right off, even member is offensive to some people, right? But that's what's scriptural. Scripture calls us members. Paul calls us members of a body. So you need to be committed to that body, to serve with Christ as the head. So we've got enough for everyone. If you can't come, do it on your own. Follow through with us. At the end of it, there's a little thing that you sign each time saying that I'm going to be committed to doing what that chapter is. So it kind of reaffirms everything because you're making a commitment to it. The movie that we're going to have, you still got a thing of it, Logan? Grace card, if you can get it up, 